Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to the Bee Biosecurity Online Talk. Um, most of you know me by now, I'm Rebecca. I'm the Bee Biosecurity Officer for Queensland. Also joining us tonight are Kerry and Susie who are doing production. And Hamish is gonna help me out at the end with some of the questions. Um, tonight is the third talk in Series 3. If you missed our earlier talks in this series, taking your bees or bee products into state, or biosecurity pests and diseases of native bees. You can always catch up uh, with these or any of our other previous talks if you go to the DAF Biosecurity YouTube channel. They should all be there. Of course, if you have any problems finding them, give me a quick email and I'll send you through the link. Tonight's talk is on apiary management for crop pollination. And we've got two more talks in, these, in this series. Um, the next one is going to be on some of our less common bee viruses, and we've got a really uh, interesting special guest for that one. We're also going to be hearing a little bit in that one about how people in the UK have dealt with having Varroa and the viruses that uh, are distributed by Varroa. So that's going to be a really interesting one, and it'll help beekeepers get a, a feel for what it's like to have Varroa and how they might need to prepare. And then our final talk in this series is Swarms and Swarming uh, in that first uh, Tuesday of April. I've already got a few lined up for series four as well, but if you have any suggestions or things you'd really like me to talk about, send me through a quick email and I'll add them to the list. Now tonight's talk on apiary management for crop pollination is going to uh, talk a little bit of both about crop pollination for home gardeners as well as farmers, so people with much larger crops. So let's start though by talking about what pollination is and just to give a bit of background so we're all on the same uh, page. So just like animals, uh, in order for plants to reproduce, they need the male parts and the female bits to come together. And in plants, um, we've got uh, the male bits being the stamen, which is the filament. And on the top of the filament, you can see there's an anther, and in that anther is some pollen. And pollen is like the sperm of the, of the male plant. So it needs to come in contact with the female bit, which is the pistil, and it's consisting of the ovaries, where the eggs are, um, and the style and the stigma right on the very top there. And so that pollen has to get from that anther over onto the stigma. Now, in some plants, like I just showed the flower I just showed you, the male and female bits are inside the same flower. And these are plants with hermaphrodite flowers. So the pollen doesn't have to go very far, but it still needs to get from that anther over to the stigma. In other plants, called monoecious plants, the male and female flowers are on the same plant, but in different flowers. So some flowers will just be male flowers, some will be just female flowers. And in other plants, again, called dioecious plants, they're separate plants with male, just male flowers and other separate plants with just female flowers. And in this case, you can probably imagine the pollen has to travel quite a bit further to get from that male plant over to the flowers on the female plant. So how does it happen? And, and why is it really important that we have bees for pollination? Well, there's a couple of different ways that pollen can be moved. For many plants, um, it can be moved through wind or water. So something like wheat, wind blows, and pollen moves and pollination happens. So it's pretty easy. But for 87.5% um, of flowering plants, so vast majority of flowering plants, they need uh, animals to help pollinate them. And those animals might be birds or bats. And in particular, in places like rainforests, bats play a really important role. But most of the time in most places, it's insects that are the key pollinators. And in particular, of course, our bees. So why are bees such good pollinators? Bees are the most common pollinators of both crops and wild plants. And there's a couple of reasons. For a start, bees are out there purposefully collecting that pollen. So most other pollinators out there, birds, other insects, end up getting pollen on them and moving that pollen around just incidentally. They just brushed against it and then they brushed against something else. Whereas those bees are really going for that pollen and collecting it. So they're more likely to be good at moving that pollen around. There's also, of course, lots of different species of bees, and each of them can have different body shapes. And so they tend to fit a whole range of different flowers as a bee for every flower, bee for every job. And bees have also got bodies that are really designed for it as well. They've got hairy little bodies that pick that pollen up, collect it. And they've also got pollen baskets, specific little places on their legs that where they collect their pollen. You can see this guy here, 
he has his pollen baskets pretty full. So what happens if you don't have those bees or they're not really being very effective at doing their job? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, there's a few things. For a start, of course, you're going to get either no fruit, vegetables or seed production, which are really important, of course. Um, and if you're a, a farmer, that means that you're not going to have a crop and you're not going to have enough produce to sell. Uh, if you're a backyard gardener, your, your garden's not going so well. And if you're uh, thinking about this on a global scale, if we don't have bees or bees aren't being good pollinators, it could mean um, really quite important things like bee shortages. Um, poor pollination um, not only means less fruit or no fruit, it can also mean that they're small or misshapen. So you can see some examples here. I had a couple of cucumbers while I was away over the summer that ended up a little bit like this one on the right here, where you don't have the fruit coming all the way um, out and extending. It's just not quite right, and that's because it hasn't had proper pollination. So how do we make sure we have effective pollination? Well, there's a few different components. Firstly, you've got to have sufficient bees. You've got to have enough bees out there doing that job. And those bees have to be healthy. In conjunction with having enough bees, you've got to place them in the right places around the, the crop that you're trying to pollinate. It's also important that the bees have sufficient resources. Now, this is because uh, bees, of course, as we know already, need not only pollen, which is a source of things like protein, but also need nectar for energy. And a lot of plants um, will produce a lot of pollen and not much nectar or the other way around. And so if you're putting a, bees on a crop that's got lots of pollen, they also need to make sure they've got enough food, enough energy in the form of enough nectar or stored honey or sugar. So making sure they have sufficient resources. And it's also important to keep in mind when you're looking at different crops, that not only do you need enough pollinators, but for some plants or some crops, you might require several different varieties to be present. Um, and that's just a, a little bit of an aside. And this is because for some particular plants, um, varieties might only flower for a short period of time with just female flowers and then flower later with just male flowers. And if you don't have a compatible um, variety which produces the males and females at the same time, you might end up without good pollination. So keep that in mind as well. It's important to have that in your plan for pollination. So let's start with how many bees do I need? How many is sufficient? Well, of course, it, it's a bit dependent. It depends on the crop for what plants are it is you're trying to pollinate and how much of them there are. But it can also, of course, depend on the strength of the hives. If you've got weak hives, a few bees, you'll, of course, need more hives to ensure you've got the same level of pollination. It can also depend a little bit on the surrounding crops. So if you have a crop that's not particularly attractive to bees, right next to a crop that's very attractive to bees, it could be that your bees will just head right over to that other crop. And so in order to make sure you've got enough pollination, you might have to have a lot more bees on your particular crop to make sure they're actually covering it and not going off to some other one, other plants next door. So if you've got a backyard garden, then most of the time one hive is probably quite sufficient. There might be other factors, of course, though, that change your mind about how many hives you might want. Um, and one of these might be to make sure you can repopulate your apiary after the hive dies out. And this is what led me from going from one beehive to more beehives, is because I had a hive die out and I went, oh, now I don't have bees that I can um, split to get more bees. So that can often lead people to get two or three hives. Of course, keep in mind um, that different city councils have different rules that uh, dictate how many hives you can have. So check with your city council how many hives you can have on your size block in your area. Let's talk now a little bit about some of these different big crops that uh, require pollination and a little bit about um, their needs. So almonds is one of the biggest crops that requires pollination every year. It's a big event. Lots of beekeepers go um, to these uh, big pollination events. And so it's important to ensure that we've got really good bee biosecurity at these events because you, you can imagine it's a little bit like having a party during COVID. Um, you've got lots of bees coming together. Um, they're all mingling. If some of them are sick, it's a good chance that that is when they're going to pass that sickness on to the other bees. So if they've got a pest or disease, it can spread 
and then all the bees that have been brought together from different areas go home and take that pest disease with them. So when things like the almond pollination occurs, it's really important that people have good biosecurity and have checked their hives well before they bring them in and it prevents those super spreading events. So for almonds, a huge number of hives are required every year. Every year. So 200,000 hives are required during that fairly short pollination season. And almonds are also the first food of the season, so the kind of first flowering plant. So often our bees can be a little sluggish still, and they can also be um, in sometimes poor condition because they're coming out of winter. So they need a little bit of extra care as well um, when we take our bees to almonds. Around six to seven hives is required per hectare for pollination of uh, almond crops. And when you decide where you're going to put them, it's not only important to make sure that they're spread throughout the crop, but also that they're in warm shelter positions. And that is just because it's still going to be quite cool. And if we want them out there doing their pollination job, they need to be warm inside the hive. Some crops require you, not require you, I guess, but um, are more profitable if you wait until a certain percentage of the plants are flowering before you put the bees onto the crop. And for almonds, it's around 10%. It's not really worth it till you get to that 10% of plants flowering before you put your bees on. Avocados are another big one here in Queensland. Um, and for these ones, you wait until 5 to 10% of the crop is flowering. It's a fairly um, lengthy, uh, or average, I guess, uh, period of flowering, where it can be anywhere from six to eight weeks that it's flowering. But the flowers are only open for a really short period of time. So it's very specific. You've got to have the pollinators there when those flowers are open. And they're only open for around two to six hours a day over two consecutive days. And in the morning, we tend to have one sex of flower open and then they close in the middle of the day and then the opposite sex open in the afternoon. So they're very specific. Um, and so you need to have a, a quite a lot of bees to ensure that you're getting that pollination happening during that very tight window. They also need at least 20 pollen grains need to be deposited or moved on a flower before it'll produce any fruit. So it needs quite a lot of pollen to be moved. So around five to eight hives per hectare is required for avocados. And you need to also make sure it's spread pretty evenly throughout the orchard. So groups of two to four hives um, spread throughout the whole area. Macadamias are an expanding crop as well at the moment, particularly up in areas in Queensland and northern New South Wales. The flowers are attractive for bees for around three days after they open, so it's a little bit of a longer window than some of the others. And they produce relatively small amounts of nectar, so you need to make sure you, your bees have another source of food. Around five to eight hives are required per hectare. But the bees need to visit quite a lot, so 150 visits are required to get uh, one of the full um, uh, strands of flowers totally pollinated. So it needs quite a lot of bees. Uh, and it's important when you're doing uh, macadamias to not do uh, pollen trapping or stripping, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Just some other crops, so things like uh, broadacre crops, so canola requires around six hives per hectare, Sunflowers around three to five, and faba beans around two hives per hectare. Now, cotton has been shown to also have some benefits to having bees there to pollinate it, but only really around one hive per hectare. And I want to throw out a bit of a warning here for people thinking they're going to take their bees to cotton. It's um, certainly a, a good crop to take to, for pollination, but you need to be quite careful about the spraying and chemicals used because there's quite a few nasty chemicals sprayed on cotton that uh, impact on bees. When we're dealing with these very big broad acre crops, it can be difficult to get bees into the crop, but make sure at least they're as close as possible to the crop so that the bees can access. Just quickly, some other um, fruit I have here and some of the um, stocking levels. So this is the number of hives per hectare required. So apples, one to 12, so quite a big range there, and that is really dependent on the variety. Uh, pears, 1.2 to 5. Berries, 0.5 to 0.2. Cherries, 2 to 3. Blueberries, 8 to 10, so quite a few more. Melons, 2 to 5. And passion fruit, 2 to 3. Highs per hectare. Now, strawberries have a really wide range from 2 to 22. And that's because 
the flowers of strawberries on different um, varieties of strawberries vary quite differently. And so, and some strawberries only require just a few bees per hectare and others require a lot higher levels of bee pollination. So check on the variety there. Lychees are, are another expanding industry. So two to three hives per hectare. Peaches, apricots and plums or the stone fruit, somewhere between two and five for those ones. Some vegetables that require or uh, are helped by having bees for pollination are pumpkin squash and zucchini. So you need around one to eight highs per hectare for those. If you're growing carrots for seed carrots rather than just for eating, around 10 hives per hectare. And onions are actually pretty fussy. They need 30 hives per hectare to have a good level of pollination. And they can um, uh, require you to make sure that you don't feed your bees or trap the pollen again on these ones here just to keep that level of pollination going. So how do we prepare our bees for pollination, whether it's in our backyard and we want to make sure our veggies get pollinated or if we're taking them to a big crop? So first make sure they've got sufficient honey supplies to get them through. You may need to feed them um, and so keep that in mind and check those honey supplies before you go. And also, if you're taking them to a big pollination event, feed them in advance so that they have stores available. Check your hives for pest diseases and remove any diseased or suspected diseased hives from your apiary. So check them before you go and make sure you get rid of anything that's a problem or if you can treat it, treat it before you go. Check your hives are structurally sound so they've got no holes and they're going to be standing up quite well for travel. Make sure your registration is up to date um, and your honey testing, particularly if you're traveling interstate and also make sure you acquire any permits or health certificates if you're going on that interstate move. Develop a pollination agreement is another important thing to do and I'm going to go through that in a minute, but also maintaining records. So how many hives did you take? What state were they in before you took them? Um, where did you go? What crop were you pollinating? And then when you're coming out again, make sure you've got records of the state of your hives, um, how long they were in the crops and anything else. So if you come back with a pest or disease, so that you know what's going on, what the impacts likely to be in the future on your bees, and if you might have picked something up that you need to be concerned about. So ideally, if you're going to take uh, hives to, to pollination, what you really want to have is hives with five to seven full depth frames, uh, brood frame, 50% uh, of full of brood at all different stages of development. So quite a lot of brood there. Make sure you've got a prolific queen, so a young queen who's laying lots. Uh, you want to have bees covering around 12 frames and you want to have sufficient honey stores for the terminal poll pollination if you can. So make sure that they're really um, strong hives. Now I mentioned just before about pollination agreements. Pollination agreements are uh, usually a written document between a farmer or a landholder and a beekeeper. So everyone understands what their role is and what is expected of them. So um, what the farmer's got to do and what the beekeeper's going to do. So some of the things that need to go into a pollination agreement are the names and addresses of all the people involved and the date the agreement's made, the location that the crop's going to be at, the number of uh, hives that are going to be hired, and the timing and delivery of those, so when they're going to come um, and how they're going to be um, delivered. The strength of the colonies hired, so some indication of uh, if they're strong colonies or weak. Uh, the distribution of hives throughout the crops, so where they're going to be put and who's going to do the distribution. And how much notice uh, is required before shifting the hives. So if the hives need to be shifted because the farmer is going to spray, um, you need to make sure that there's an agreement about how much notice you need to give the beekeeper about that. Of course, the fees and the terms of payment need to go into that agreement. Also, it's handy to include an arbitrator in case there's an event uh, of, a, of a dispute between the beekeeper and the farmer. Uh, permission and protocol for independent audit. So if you want to have someone come on or the farmer wants to come and audit those beehives, some agreement about what that will be and um, what will happen if that audit is failed. Also have some clauses in there about how you're going to protect the hives from pesticide damage while it's inside the crop and have someone witness your agreement. 
So in top of your agreement, make sure to discuss some things with the farmer or landholder. Firstly, at access, how are you going to get on there to drop your beehives off? And is there sufficient area to unload the hives? Is there somewhere you can do that effectively? Also think about the location. Um, is that area subject to flooding? Knowing that in advance is going to make a big difference. It may mean that um, you still put the hives there, but you've got to be looking out for possible flooding events and moving them before they impact on your hives. Also think about if the bees might be a nuisance. Is there anywhere in the, on the, um, around the crop that is going to be where the public are going to be or farm workers or as close to a gate or a shed where the bees are going to be disturbed or people might get stung? Particularly in the season, think about making sure that the bees can be somewhere where they've got plenty of sunlight on the hive, warm locations, so you can increase those foraging times, but also that um, discourages many of the pests coming into the hive. So make sure there's warm places. Think a little bit about slope as well. Um, preferably put your, uh, wherever possible, to put the hives on flat land. And if it's not going to be flat, discuss with a farmer how you might um, compensate for that or, or to, to make it an area that's flat. And also in terms of ground cover, um, tall plants can inhibit bee access to hives and can also make it difficult for you to go and check your hives and, and in some cases dangerous. If you can't see around the hive, there could be snakes. So try and make sure that you can have the area that the hives are going to be, if possible, uh, mowed before the hives come in. And of course, water. Is there somewhere the bees are going to have access to water? And if not, what are you going to do about it? Because your bees will need water. Now, if you're a farmer, um, make sure that firstly you obtain that pollination agreement quite a few months in advance to ensure that your bees are going to be well prepared that you get. The, the beekeeper may need several months to make sure their bees are built up to the right levels so they're ready for pollination. Also, make sure you request that your beekeeper show that they are compliant with the Australian Honey Bee Biosecurity Code of Practice. And there's a little form in the back where the beekeeper can show and the code of practice and can show you how they're, if they're compliant. Um, check your stocking rates and consider the distribution of hives before you go to a beekeeper so you have some idea of what you might need, how many bees you might need. And of course, discuss the use of chemicals with the beekeeper. Um, if you need to spray, um, let them know when that is going to be and how you might go about it and have a discussion about it. Also, if you can, find out about any surrounding crops, what they're likely to be and when they might be sprayed. That's really helpful and important information for your beekeepers. So what about during pollination? What do you need to look out for? Well, continue to check the health of your hives and as well as the honey stores to make sure that uh, for a start, they're not succumbing to a disease and that they've got sufficient food. Um, if there is not sufficient food coming in or if you want to try and maximise pollination, you may need to feed regularly um, and check on that bee's water source to make sure it hasn't dried out or been contaminated. You may also want to have a bit of a look at visitation rates. Um, if you are new to ta taking a bee to a particular crop or you're just curious, you can get an idea from how many visits the bee does, um, sorry, how many bee visits come to a particular plant over a period of time to look at how frequently they're visiting and whether or not you've got enough bees in there to have a good um, idea of the uh, pollination rates. So I've talked a little bit about feeding your bees during pollination um, and it can be really important uh, to keep up the health of your bees but also to prevent your bees straying off to other crops to forage nectar rather than doing their job of pollinating. So feeding uh, sugar to bees will minimise their foraging for sugar uh, and make them concentrate on that pollen. So sugar syrup uh, between 30 and 65 percent sugar. Um, start on the second day that the hives are put in the crop and continue right through to the end of the flowering. And generally around one litre of syrup uh, daily or two litres every second day and feed them inside the hive. Now I, I did have a bit of a um, section on an earlier talk about how to feed bees and a couple of examples here in these photos about in hive feeders. It can be anything as simple as a plastic bag, a Ziploc bag full of the sugar syrup with a couple of holes poked in the bottom, tiny holes so that that sugar syrup drips out. So some crops have low pollination rates and it's largely because they tend to be not so attractive to the bees. And that can usually be because they've got 
lower levels of nectar and are just pollen. And sometimes they don't even have a whole lot of pollen either. So you might have to try and do some things to make them more attractive to bees and make the bees really stay and do their pollination job. There's a few different ways you can do this. For a start, you might want to go about having multiple hive introductions. When you first introduce the bees to a crop, they're not going to go very far from their hive. They're going to, for the first couple of days, forage pretty close, getting the lay of the land and using up the stores in that local area. After that, they might then go, oh, let's go a bit further, check out some crop over here that's not the one I'm trying to pollinate and get nectar from over there. Um, so what you can do is put a few hives in uh, and then a few days later, put a few more hives in that are going to be new and are going to be excited about those local uh, plants in that area and not go off to new ones. So multiple hive introductions. You might also um, make sure that you've got them very well distributed throughout the crop so that bees aren't traveling long distances and possibly coming across other crops. Um, Smaller hives sometimes uh, can also be used to stop the bees venturing off too far. So in crops like melons, sometimes beekeepers use nukes. Um, those smaller hives, the less bees, tend to not go quite as far either. So that can be another strategy. Tra pollen traps can also be used. So pollen traps are uh, devices fitted to hives that sort of scrape the pollen off the bees as they enter the hives and collect it. This means the bee goes out, he collects some pollen, he comes back, he thinks he's got pollen, he goes into the hive and he's got no pollen. It's like, ah, oh, no pollen, go back and do the pollination thing again. So that will mean they'll continue to go out and um, visit those flowers despite low ne nectar availability because they still need pollen. So that's another way you might go about uh, increasing pollination. Um, of course, feeding sugar syrup helps them uh, not need to go that far to visit the other crops for nectar. And in few studies have also shown that for uh, plums, European pears, apples and mashies, spraying the flowers with sugar syrup can also increase the number of bees visiting them. So that's not really a good strategy in a lot of cases, but if you're really desperate, particularly if on, on a small scale you're finding that, you know, your apples just aren't getting pollinated, that might be another strategy you could try. Now, when it comes to taking your bees to pollination, one of the biggest risks beekeepers face is pesticides. Um, beekeepers need to discuss prior to going to farms with pollinate, where pollination is occurring, what is going to go on in terms of spraying and what chemicals the farm is likely to use so that they have an understanding of that. It's also important to try and, um, if you can, talk to surrounding farmers or gardeners. Gardeners are often um, some of the most uh, big perpetrators of spraying um, and making sure that they know you've got bees there for a start and hopefully will inform you if they intend on spraying. Um, Be Connected is another thing to consider. It's an app that is uh, been designed and you can find links through um, to the Be Connected app from the Be Aware website and it really links farmers and beekeepers together. So if you're a beekeeper, you say the location of where your bees are going to be. And if you're a farmer, you say when you're going to spray and where you're going to spray. So beekeepers can have an idea of when um, that's going to be and move their bees out of that area. Some of the nasty chemicals that you really need to be aware of um, when people are spraying are fipronol, um, abramectin, uh, endoxacarp, uh, cindosad, uh, pyrethroids. Organophos phosphates and some of the neonicotin oh, now I've got the <laughs> neonicotinoids. Oh, I can't say that last one. So those are ones, some of the key ones. But make sure for anything that your farmer's going to spray on the crop that you have a look at the label and see if it's safe for bees or not, because there are other chemicals, of course, that are also um, going to harm bees. Keep in mind too that some of the things that are sprayed on to crops. Um, the chemical itself might not be highly toxic, but often uh, farmers will mix it with something like detergent, and that can be what actually causes some of the impacts on your bees. So keep that in mind as well, that detergent that's mixed with some of these chemicals is also a problem from time to time. So when it comes to pesticide use, the key thing here is try not to spray on flowering plants because that's where your bees are going to visit. 
If it can't be avoided, if you've got to spray while bees are in the area, try and spray in the evening. That means that the bees have gone to bed already and should not be impacted direct by the direct spraying. And hopefully they've got all night um, for that spray to dry on the plant before the bees are out and foraging the next day. Um, also consider the flight paths. So it's not just those flowering plants where bees might come in contact with the chemical, but they might have to fly from the hives through the spray into areas where the flowers are, and that can be a problem as well. And also consider water sources. Chemicals can get into the water sources that bees are using, and that can also poison them. So those are the main things um, to keep in mind when taking a bee's to pollination to get the most out of um, pollination events. Of course, the key one is to think about checking your hives for pests and diseases. Otherwise, you're taking uh, risky hives to areas where they could spread, or you might be picking up diseases from those risky locations where you've got lots of bees together all in the one location. So that's it for me to, to, for tonight, but let's see if we've got any questions. And let's see. Okay, we've got someone here who's commented that they've got roughly 2,000 bees in their garden, both honeybees and native stingless hives, and they still have to hand pollinate their zucchini and pumpkin. And this can be the case. Um, we often find that some of these plants, particularly zucchini and pumpkin, um, I find that's the same thing in my garden. I end up having to hand pollinate them. Um, some of the things you might try, um, give a go um, at uh, trying to, make sure your bees have plenty of food, plenty of nectar. They're not going off chasing nectar. Um, that might help. Um, but unfortunately, some of these plants, particularly on a small scale like that, you um, sometimes find that you don't necessarily get the same level of pollination that you would like. Um, Hamish, you've got any comments there on that one? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. The things that come to mind for that one are um, perhaps the um, garden has other attractive species that um, just are drawing them away from the zucchini and pumpkin. And the other thing is if there are resident honeybees there, um, perhaps the pumpkin and zucchini aren't new to them. Um, that's why I guess in commercial settings, um, beehives are brought in, um, you know, around that 10% flowering um, point so that um, there is something you know quite attractive um, on mass for the bees mm -hmm. to, to go to. So there are a couple of things that come to mind. Um, I'm a little unclear in the question whether there are um, bees in a beehive in the garden or they're just visiting from um, uh, neighboring areas, but uh, they're just some of the things that come to mind for that one. Yeah, thanks Hamish. Yeah, I, I think sometimes, you know, if it, if there's only just a couple of flowers and um, they're high in pollen and not nectar, the bees sometimes, you know, go, I, I know somewhere far more profitable and the way bees work, um, one bee finds a really good place, they tell all their friends and um, that ends up being the source that all the bees tend to rock up at um, and you might find that they're just overlooking your flowers in your garden, unfortunately. Um, that's uh, about all the other questions that we have so far tonight. Um, I'm just thought I'd give you an opportunity, Hamish, if you've got any other comments about people taking stuff through to pollination events and um, anything you want to highlight. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. I think um, you covered it so well, but um, it can't be um, emphasised too much the, um, the impact of chemicals. So um, just if you are thinking of going into it commercially you know in some sort of um, agricultural setting just to be aware of um, not only what is on farm but also the surrounding farms um, there are just so many incidental um, unexplained uh, bee deaths that um, you know are, uh, are very upsetting and disappointing for all parties especially the beekeeper and a huge economical um, impact as well so that's that's one thing um, and I suppose um, 
<clears throat> just the other thing is, um, you know, bees uh, still, although they are doing their job of pollination, <clears throat> they can be um, uh, an issue for s farm workers. So they do have to be placed somewhere where they're out of um, perhaps um, thoroughfares and things like that. Um, and also in smaller garden settings, if um, if you've got um, quite a good garden, you do need to be mindful of where they're being placed um, for you know public access and things like that, um, and um, neighbours as well. So they're just a couple of other points. Thanks, Hamish. Yeah, they're great points. Um, it, it it can't you can't be too careful when it comes to. Um, making sure your bees are in locations that they're not going to sting people. Um, for many people, it can be a matter of life or death um, being stung by a bee. And so, yeah, it, it's essential. And I think too, making sure that farmers are letting their other staff that are coming in on and off the farm and even people who are packers or other contractors know that there's beehives in the area just so that they can be aware of the hazard and, and know, um, know that it's there and, and if possible, uh, avoid it. So we had another couple of questions come in. Um, one question here on the ratio of sugar to water for the syrup uh, what, and what kind of sugar? Great question. Um, generally white sugar, caster sugar is good. Um, it's, it's probably the best way to go. Um, and uh, the ratio for sugar to water, um, I think on the side I there I had somewhere between 30 and 60 percent. Um, usually for bees that have another good water source somewhere else um, that you're not trying to ensure that they've got water and sugar coming um, solely from you feeding them, you can go on the higher end of that percentage. Um, Hamish, uh, do you want uh, to add Rebecca. Yeah. Yeah, thanks Rebecca. Just um, with the sugar there, um, it's important that they don't feed um, uh, brown sugar. Um, or raw sugar, it, does, it has to be refined, otherwise it will give them dysentery. So um, it's important to feed the, the refined sugar. Great point. Yeah, it, it, is, it is really um, a, a key one there. Um, and just a comment here um, from Maggie, um, thanking us for the session. So thanks, Maggie. Um, we love having you guys come along every night. And I think um, we are out of questions. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, I'll be back again next month, first Tuesday of the month um, and seven o'clock. Please join me again. We have a special guest uh, next time and I think it's going to be a really, really interesting talk. So um, I'll see you all then.